the ball, the billiard ball A, hit billiard ball B, thereby causing billiard ball B to move, thereby causing the um, another way to express this uh, central, this uh, sentential connective. Um, okay, finally, bringing it all together. Uh, I want to bring together everything I've said about ontology, the metal, and causation by considering the relation between two kinds of causal narratives. Causal narratives are history, largely imaginary, because I'm not going to be able to present them, involving only the vocabulary of physics. And causal narratives are histories of the everyday sort, narratives involving the vocabulary we use in everyday life, including our everyday mental vocabulary. Let's begin by considering a narrative, a narrative that is permeated by this everyday mental vocabulary. Suppose that a friend asks Alice this question. I see that Tom has a black eye. How did that happen? And suppose that Alice responds with the following causal narrative, a narrative that provides an answer to this how did it happen question, and in that sense constitutes an explanation of the fact that Tom has a black eye. Well, you know what a jealous husband Fred is. At the party last night, Fred confronted Tom and demanded to know whether Tom was having an affair with his wife, and Tom confessed that he was. That enraged Fred, and he punched Tom in the face. While that narrative is certainly permeated, as I said, permeated by our everyday mental vocabulary, and in addition to obvious pieces of mental language like jealous and enraged, there are words like confront and demand and confess that can be applied only to sapient beings. Now contrast this mental narrative with what we might call God's physical narrative, a narrative that describes the behavior of individual elementary particles, the particles that collectively compose Tom and Fred in some significant proportion of their environment over a certain stretch of time. Of course, God's narrative wouldn't strictly speaking constitute an explanation of Tom's having a black eye or Fred's having struck Tom. It would constitute an explanation of how a certain set of elementary particles came to be arranged in a certain way at a certain time. Nevertheless, the arrangements of these particles at various points in God's narrative were such that the states of affairs that we mere human beings call Fred striking Tom in the face and Tom's having a black eye supervened on those arrangements. That is to say, God's narrative explains a lot more than Fred's striking Tom and Tom's having a black eye, but in some sense it explains those things among many other things, all the things that supervene on the truth of the narrative. Now let's leave uh, these two explanatory narratives aside for the minute, the two narratives that involve Tom and Fred, and uh, consider two other explanatory narratives. We'll first consider an everyday physical explanation, an explanation conducted in the language of everyday life that involves nothing more than changes in and interactions among inanimate objects. A child asks, Daddy, when you put the key into the keyhole and turn it, the door stops being locked. What makes that happen? And father responds to this question with a causal narrative. Well, sweetheart, here's what happens when you turn the key in the keyhole. There are little teeth and slots in the key, and the key fits into a thing inside the lock that also has little teeth and slots. The teeth and slots in the key just match those on the thing inside the lock, so it's possible to turn the key. When the, lock is, when the door is locked, there's a little bolt that sticks out of the lock into the door jamb, and turning the key pushes the bolt out of the jamb and back inside the lock. That's what we call unlocking the door, and then we can push the door open. Contrast this narrative with God's narrative a story of the evolution of an enormous assemblage of elementary particles, a story that ends with a description of a vastly intricate distribution of particles that, as we might say, includes the doors being unlocked. That is, the truth of the proposition that the door is unlocked supervenes on that distribution. Now let us compare these two pairs of narratives. On the one hand, we've got the human narrative involving mental language and God's physical narrative. On the other hand, we've got the human a uh, narrative that involves only inanimate objects and God's physical narrative. Um, the human narrative that explains how Tom got a black eye and the human narrative that explains how turning a key leads to an unlocked door and the two God's eye stories of the evolution of systems of elementary particles are all four of them explanatory narr narratives, causal narratives. All are stories whose only characters are substances and attributes and relations. In each case, the successive chapters of the story are episodes of substances acquiring or losing certain attributes and coming to stand in certain relations and ceasing to stand in certain relations. Let's consider a father's explanation of how turning a key unlocks a door. 
I can see no reason to think that explanation isn't correct. That is, I see no reason to doubt either of the following statements. Statement A, when Father says, well, sweetheart, here's what happens when you turn the key in the keyhole, that is a true statement about the story he is about to tell the child. Of course, the story doesn't include everything that goes on inside the key and the lock and the door and the bolt and the jam. It's not God's narrative. God's narrative includes, or it does if current physics is more or less right, lots of statements about the exchange of photons by charged particles. And Father's narrative includes nothing about photons or charged particles. Nevertheless, Father speaks the truth about the narrative he is about to present when he says, here's what happens when you turn the key in the keyhole. Statement B, if Father's preface to his narrative is a true statement, then his causal narrative does count as an answer to his child's request for an explanation. And that is what a causal explanation, X is having come to be F, is. A correct answer to the question, how did X get to be F, in which causal verbs like uh, fit, turn, push, play a central and essential role, and in which my sentential uh, connective uh, figure says the only other uh, language that could possibly be called causal language. No one would suppose, I think, that Father's statement, here's what happens when you turn the key in the keyhole, is falsified or vitiated or in any way undermined by the fact that God can give an unimaginably intricate explanation of a vastly complex state of affairs that in a certain sense includes the doors being unlocked after the key has been turned. Is there any reason to think that the fact that God can present a causal narrative, a narrative couched entirely in terms of the interactions of elementary particles, um, one that in this same vague sense includes Fred striking Tom and Tom's consequent black eye, in any way falsifies or undermines or vitiates the following explanation? Well, you know what a jealous husband Fred is, blah, blah, blah. Um, or that it falsifies or vitiates or undermines the claim that the little narrative is a correct answer to the question, how did Tom, Tom come to have a black eye? Now this explanation, this narrative, contains, no, uh, contains mental language. Father's explanation of the unlocked door contained no mental language. Does that make a difference? A difference that would have the consequence that the latter explanation was correct, but the former incorrect. The latter human uh, explanation, the, um, the explanation of the door was correct, but the explanation of the black eye incorrect. Well, there are arguments that might suggest uh, something of that sort, arguments associated with the work of Jaeguan Kim. And these arguments are thought by many, at the very least, to propose a genuine and difficult philosophical problem. Here's one argument of that sort. If mental states supervene on physical states, and if the physical states of things that make up the world at a given time cause all subsequent physical states, it cannot be that such mental states as some things may have or be in at a certain time cause subsequent physical events. Uh, or you might put the same point in the form of a question. Maybe you don't think it's a knockdown argument, but you think it's a serious challenge to anybody who thinks that mental causation exists. So how can it be, for example, that a sudden access of pain can cause me to wince or that my desiring to vote for the measure and my belief that raising my right hand will be a vote for the measure can jointly cause my hand to rise if my having the pain at T or my having the desire and the belief at T supervene on the distribution of matter and radiation at T and that that distribution is causally sufficient for my wincing or my raising my hand shortly after T. Well, suppose we agree with those who pose this question that the distribution of the instantiation of metal properties properties that imply either or both of the properties, being a thing that thinks and being a thing that feels, super means on the distribution of matter and radiation in space-time. But suppose we also affirm the following three theses, that mental states and physical states are abstract objects and thus have no causal powers whatever, that there are no events, either mental or physical, that while there are causal relations and causal explanations, there is no such relation as causation. The interlocutor speaks. But, but how can you possibly say that a physical state like being red hot has no causal powers? If a poker is in that state, it obviously has the power to heat or burn things with which it comes into contact. And I reply, yes, but the obvious truth of what you have said doesn't imply that being red hot has the power to heat or burn things. Being red hot doesn't have causal powers, it is a causal power. It is, as you have said, the poker that has the power 
to heat or burn things. 